Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. I've actually presented once or twice before for CITF for pleasure in different venues. Um, and they do great, great work here. So thanks for coming out using your lunchtime. Um, because you've shown up, you're getting a bonus. <laughs> Rather than uh, talking about just the one study, it turns out we've done three studies that are kind of related. And so what I'd like to do is present the background and some summary results from the three. And they're all about the same topic, but each one focuses on a kind of different issue or area. And so what that means is that, that you know, there's a lot more information, but I'm not really talking about the details of each one. I'm going to actually go through and show you some details. In fact, I even have some images for results tables just to assert my credibility so that you know that I've actually done this stuff. <laughs> but I'm not gonna, I don't really care about the small details. So it's kind of a mix. Um, so we've so we had like 45 minutes, right? Yeah, so about 15 minutes per study. But basically, it's kind of a program of research. And I've been doing this with Katie Pierce, who's now an assistant professor at University of Washington. She was a graduate student here. She actually worked for the Carsey Wolf Center for a while. I think she actually did a little work at CITF. Yeah, and everybody in the world knows Katie. She's just, she knows everything about everything. Um, and she's just an alien. She, uh, just in how somebody so young can know so much. And she's been around the world. And she speaks multiple languages. And she's worked with the State Department. And she's had Fulbrights. And so I just kind of follow in her wake. <laughs> I've been really uh, <coughs> honored to work with her. I was the chair of her dissertation, uh, from which some of this comes. But, but a lot of it has been since then. And she also has access to amazing data. because. Um, she, uh, it, Armenia is a very interesting country for a lot of reasons. We'll talk about some, but it's a small country divided by a large mountain range, and it's been very isolated over hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, uh, Armenian is not really related to any other language very much, but also there are two dialects in Armenian. And until recently, most Armenians only spoke the dialect on their side of the mountain. Katie, of course, speaks both dialects. Just I met her parents once, and the first thing I asked her is, what did you feed this woman? <laughs> and they said, we have no idea what she ate. So anyway, so the basic thing is, it, the, the basic foundation is the digital divide, uh, looking at internet and mobile phone in these former Soviet uh, countries, and then also bringing into bear a couple tweaks on this, including uh, diffusion theory, the role of different devices like mobile phone versus internet, um, language and then activities. So each one kind of extends the basic model a little bit. Um, so these are the topics. I'll go over digital divide and equality. Many of you are familiar with this, so I don't have to talk about too much. A little bit about the context of these very interesting countries. Um, and then the three studies are a basic internet digital divide study, but we bring to bear the issue of language, which is really relevant for these countries because of the nature of their languages. The second one is comparing PC and mobile internet and how they differentially um, influence the kind of activities that people do. And that relates back to a digital divide issue as well. And then the third one is sort of not really comparing, but tweaking the divide literature by taking a diffusion approach and seeing whether that makes a difference in terms of what explains what. So these are the three studies. And um, maybe we'll have a summary. So the first one is this basic argument. And, and you're all familiar with this. It's, the, it's a sort of uh, originated with concerns about access to computers in the US. And then it quickly morphed into specific uh, internet access. It's also been applied to telephone. Uh, you know, Universal service in the early 1900s in the US was a principle. And the argument was that everybody should have access to telephones. And there was all sorts of social as well as economic analyses of those. And still not everybody does have access to telephones. Um, uh, and other factors like the Rural Electrification Administrator made a big difference because it provided electricity, which would actually then allow phones to be used in rural areas. So very interesting area. So the argument here is, is that, um, yes, things diffuse over time, and maybe possibly everything will be adopted by everybody eventually. But some things don't diffuse completely. Some people don't get access. And there are also differential consequences. People who adopt something early begin to gain earlier and different kinds of benefits than people who adopt later. And so it's not just a question of everybody eventually keeping up. Keeping up. In fact, some people argue that there's a feedback loop that actually the social inequality, which creates the divides to start with, are that actually exacerbated as people differentially use these new innovations, particularly communication innovations, information and communication ones, because they have access to information and therefore resources and therefore the ability to improve your life or become a better citizen or whatever. And there's really a lot of really interesting uh, literature um, and it's been around for quite a long time. So uh, there's kind of 
to a variety of different theoretical approaches. But the simplest one is called the Matthew effect, and that comes from the Bible, and that is this, you know, to the person who does good things, more good things happen. Um, and that's kind of the general argument that people use, but it's not really a theory. More theoretical is the knowledge gap, and this argues that if there's differences in abilities, cognitive abilities, and domain knowledge to start with, then as new knowledge comes, everybody might improve, but in fact the people of more might actually improve more. And so on, if you just look at mean levels, you see, oh, things have improved. But in fact, the gap, the knowledge gap, can actually widen even though everybody increases. And this was first found in the evaluation of Sesame Street, which people developed in order to help kids who were brought you know, came home from school early in poor areas, didn't have parents, just watched a lot of TV. They figured this would be a supplement to their education. But what they found in the first evaluations is that, yeah, those kids gained something, but kids who had other knowledge gained even more. And so they said, well, maybe we need to revise Sesame Street to sort of bring down the ceiling knowledge so that it helps more the kids who have less to start with. There are also, this is sort of a categorization of social perspective. This Witten Manor book is really, really very good. I just read it recently. And one is that it, it can be seen as um, a conflict or an economic thing, is that it's a scarce resource. And resources are, are distributed scarcely, and therefore people have differential access and differential benefits from them. The second is kind of cultural, which is internet affects your lifestyle, your social status, your networks. And the third one is functionality, which is um, they're just ba uses and their benefits and uses, and uh, that kind of motivates, the kind of incentives for using uh, these differentially. And then the last one is a more global thing, is the general thing of inclusion and exclusion. As I mentioned, if there's exclusion and differentiality to start with, then if these things are not made available or accessible evenly, it can actually increase rather than reduce it. So those are kind of the pers perspectives, and we're going to basically use a bit of each. So another uh, recent development in the literature is this notion of multiple divides. The early divide was basically access or adoption or not. And now we can see there's really a quite a long range. Actually, before access is awareness. And we found in our 2000 book on social consequences of internet use that at that time there was still a lot of people who weren't even aware what the internet was. And that's still the case in, in these countries. And without awareness, of course, even if you have access, it doesn't matter. Access. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean adoption. It means you have it, you could get it, but you haven't actually started using it. After adoption, then you have to have certain skills to use various tools and resources. Then the device and technology may matter, broadband, computer, mobile phone based, and that's kind of what we're looking at here. Then there's differences in the kind of usage, overtime usage, the frequency of usage, duration of usage. An early study on computer mediated communication by Hiltz and Turoff showed that people who had, at that time, this is like early 80s. People who had about 100 hours of uh, computer mediated use begin to use the network at that time, BitNet, differently, qualitatively differently, so that you begin to understand things and how things fit together. And therefore, you would gain benefits that weren't even um, imaginable by earlier users. There's also content, and we'll see with respect to language. Uh, that's less an issue now, but certainly early on. It's, all the content was primarily English, and not only in terms of people who don't have language, but in terms of reading skills and processing skills. Um, we can also see that beyond that, there are activities. There are different kinds of things you can now do online, good, bad, entertaining, not entertaining, helpful, not. not. And the question is whether those are also differentially distributed because of the underlying demographic differences or other kinds of social differences. And I can, you know, you're taking lots of notes. If you like, I can make this PowerPoint available so you don't have to take notes. Because, because your skills are really low. You're writing down things and you think they're really important. But I just want you to know they're not. Um, and then, of course, that leads to all sorts of consequences and implications. And, and the social capital label is kind of used to summarize these. But it can be as much, you know, getting health information or figuring out uh, where the best schools are if you're moving or how to get food stamps or whatever. And then the notion that this feedback goes back. Because if you, if you go all the way through this and you get to this point and you generate a lot of positive social capital, then you're going to have access to a lot more tools and you'll be able to understand them more and adopt earlier. And so it can actually exacerbate these differences. So that's a really interesting implication because that's not really in the early arguments about digital divide. It was everybody has access and once they do, that's great. Again, lots of really interesting. I've just listed a very few here. Well, 
I don't have to go into this, but you know there's lots of socio-demographic differences and there's reasons for all these, you know. Most in the division literature, older people tend to adopt earlier, but in the technology literature, younger people tend to adopt earlier. Um, there are gender differences, although a lot fewer, the, 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 the gender difference in internet adoption disappeared in the U.S. a long time ago. And you'll see in these countries, that doesn't exist at all. There's some very interesting paradoxes about these countries that we'll, we'll look at. Marital status, household side, maybe the notion is if you have more people, you have more need to connect with each other. And there's also a critical mass internally. Um, employment, economic being, if there's costs, of course, that, that matters. Um, we see in these areas that urbanists, we might say you know, rural, urban, but here there's some more distinctions. Um, these are really important in these countries because the former Soviet countries have very, very, very stark differences by you know, all the resources are put into the capital cities and the rural so some of the rural areas simply have not changed at all. Uh, and then the, from the typical diffusion literature, you know, if you use other media, particularly other new media, then you're more likely to adopt subsequent media. It's, you have this technology cluster image in your head, and so you know how to actually be open to new things. Also, you find out more about things if you've used other media. So there's all these, and these are very standard, and most of the literature uses various forms of these. There are also uh, language influences both in terms of the technologies. Um, there are more and more multiple languages built into operating system software and keyboard functionality and in the mobile phone, but it's different. There's more in mobile phone than there is PC, and in um, the PC and the mobile phone, those language capabilities are only there if you use a standard legal operating system. So there are lots of differences, and of course the languages we'll talk about are very, very minor. It's very hard to get access to these, and they don't really map onto the keyboards very well. And so content as well. People who have non-English language, there's tons of materials now, more and more in, in, in native languages, but still, you know, most of the stuff is in English. It's de it depends upon the topic. But certainly in the health area and online learning, that's typically in English. <clears throat> okay, so let's, a little background on the context. Um, and this is all due to Katie. I don't really have any access to it. She goes out and spends time there. She knows everybody. She shows up. She, when there's a newspaper article about a recent arrest in Azerbaijan, she knows that person. It's, it's just amazing. And she tells the backstory. Oh, she just, I asked, asked, her, asked her about one just recently, a couple days ago, and she said, oh, well, she just did it to get, she likes the attention. That is the political attention. So she's in touch with everybody all the time. Um, so um, the general issue is sort of an information technology and development approach, but also the post-Soviet world, which has opened up but also is controlled in various interesting ways. So there's a lot of, like your issue about um, censorship control. I mean, that's more of an issue in those countries, and they vary, and some are really hard and some are not. So there's a really large literature, and so I won't get into it, but one of the implications are if you want to have development, then you have to provide communication technologies, and then the question is, are there divide issues that you have to worry about? So here are the three countries I'm looking at, and see, I can actually, oh, you know what I found the other day is you can't use this pointer on these screens because they're not reflective. They're only internally refractive. And so, see, boom, it goes away. It's like it's swallowed. So if you come too close to the screen, you'll be sucked in. <laughs> anyway, here's the three countries, and you thought that Georgia was in the south of the U.S., but it's not. It's actually near Turkey, which explains why it's such a foreign world. Um, so these are the three countries, and then we've also done studies in these other countries too, but these are the three we'll talk about. Very quickly, Armenia, a lot of these, of course, were former Soviet republics. They have different form of independence. In some cases, the independence is not actually necessarily better than it was before. Lots of conflicts. They have a frozen conflict with Azerbaijan, which Katie uh, seems to think is actually beneficial to um, uh, um, military providers in both countries. <laughs> There's instability, there's political strife. All these countries are very poor. A third of them don't have enough money for food. I mean, literally, on the surveys and people study. And another third can't afford it. They don't have money for clothes. That's beyond what most of us think about. Yet, they have very high literacy and education because the Soviet system really emphasized education. And so it's a very, that's one of the reasons we're looking at these. It's a very paradoxical and unique kind of situation. Azerbaijan, great oil wealth. But obviously, as in many places, not really spread a lot. And Katie used the terms full-fledged authoritarians. <laughs> and uh, Georgia, um, they also transitioned to independence, but they've had a lot of internal conflict. And then they just, oh, they, by the way, they had a war with Russia. 
They lost some of their land because they claimed independence and left. Also high poverty. They recently had a first democratic election, so there's change. So very interesting countries, very interesting countries. Language I'll just mention is very important because these languages are very unique. They're not shared widely. And most of them have scripts that are not Latin scripts, and therefore they don't map onto the keyboards. And so they have to either come up with some workaround, or they have to learn English, and then they're going to be limited. So very, very interesting. Uh, and there's a whole literature on the use of on the role of language in access and use of the internet, which I won't go into here. But we would argue that English knowledge would be important because it's such a challenge to actually communicate, and less so, but also a challenge to read uh, English. OK, so we have a variety of data sources, mostly from what's called the Caucasus Research uh, Resource Center Barometer. They measure like a barometer every year. Some of this funding comes from USAID, but some of it's from the region. And we have very, very high response rates, face-to-face -face interviews. We don't conduct these. you know, They're conducted locally. Um, and people or the reviewers always say, that's impossible. But Katie describes, uh, most of these interviews are conducted face-to-face -face in the winter in February. Nobody is going anywhere. A lot of people live together in households, so there's a lot of people to get. They're very friendly and very outgoing. So it's actually, except for the fact that it's terrible weather, it's actually a good place to do survey. <laughs> I actually said that to a reviewer. And then our last one, we have actually eight years' worth of data in Armenia. OK, so here's the first study, divides of demographics and language. And basically, um, we looked at that kind of sequence. Are they aware? Most people are aware of the internet. Do they use it? Uh, not so many. You know, still quite low percentages, as you can see, um, from about 30% to 25%. Uh, so we're right on the beginning, right at the cusp in general for most of these countries. Uh, so overall, there are significant, we have complex models. And overall, there's a significant difference across the countries. But most people don't really care about the different countries. And so we have a problem if the reviewers want to collapse, us, collapse the data or only study one. And Katie says, if I collapse the data, people that I know in those countries will come and kill me. Because they are so, you know, our country is unique. You cannot possibly group us with this other country. So if we have the overall model, it fits the data very, very well. It would explain 10% of the variance in awareness. But it's very high awareness, so there's not a lot of variance in that to explain. 38% internet adoption and a lot in use. And what we find, here's the model, just to show you we did it. OK. Um, um, so there are still divides, even though there's high awareness. And of course, um, younger people are more aware, males are more aware, higher education, and more urbanism, more in the city. They're more aware, but awareness is high in general. But there's still some differences. In terms of adoption, um, uh, again, younger, but also economic well-being, positive education, urbanness, and English. English is a very, I bold these, these are the strongest influences. So English is the strongest influence on adoption, given that people are aware, which is, you know, we don't see that in usual digital divide studies because we study it mostly in the US or in, or in Western Europe. We also ask people why they didn't adopt. And economic, of course, they don't have the equipment, they don't know how to use it, they're not interested, they don't need it, they don't have time. And that, there's a whole interesting literature on motivations for using the internet. And this notion of I'm not interested, or even I've used it, but now I've not used it, this is a sort of a dropout effect, also shows up in the literature a lot. We did some studies of that in the early two, uh, late 1900s, well, 1990s. Um, in terms of usage, uh, some of the same uh, effects. Again, English is uh, largest after adoption. Given that you've adopted, having uh, higher English skills actually affects the frequency and duration of how much you use it. However, all these influences are, are less than for adoption. And so the, the, the basic divide is adoption. Getting people to adopt is the big thing. And I find this in a lot of my research, too, is that after that, levels of usage don't really predict much difference. It's whether you use it or not. But getting to that point is really hard, really hard. Um, because you might argue once you've adopted, then there's a lot of other factors affecting usage. Personal preferences, you know, related to various activities. Um, but we'll see activities matter. OK, so that's the first study. And see, we actually did these models. OK, any comments or questions? That's the first study. Kind of breathless. OK, so that's just kind of the basic background. And the issue there is, is that English plays a much, much stronger role than, than you might think, because most studies 
are with people who speak English. But you also see the adoption is the biggest barrier. OK, so now one of the things we're interested in is um, with mo the, the, the growth of mobile phone. And in most of these countries, the internet came very, very late. There's no inf you know, most of these places had difficulty even getting wired telephones, much less access to computers and modems. And so in most of these countries, the internet started very late. And by that time, mobile phone was already available. So mobile phone growing very quickly as the source for internet. And you get the mobile phone, you can walk around. You don't have to have a PC at home. And so this relates to the whole telecommunications development issue of leapfrogging. That is, we don't have to go through that huge wired infrastructural stage to get to development. We can just leapfrog and go to right to wireless. And that's what some people are arguing. But there's a lot of literature criticizing. But there's still lots of problems with mobile phones. Bandwidth, coverage, cost, reliability, you know, all that kind of stuff. OK, so what we want to see here is we've seen that activities might vary, but do they, are they affected? Is there another divide with respect to access to the two devices? And then does that matter in terms of the kind of activities? Because if you, if you argue the leapfrog effect, you say, well, give everybody a mobile phone, and then everything will be OK. But is it the case? Are they going to do the same thing with a mobile phone as they do with the PC-based internet? So um, there's literature on things that affect use of the two. And we did early studies on the interaction between internet and mobile phone. Is that you have both, neither one or the other. Um, and there's been some recent studies um, by Donner et al. looking more specifically on PC-based versus mobile-based internet. So there's some interesting literature on that. Um, the mobile phone might augment the use of PC, or might replace it, or might leapfrog it. That is, once you have the mobile phone, you might never think about getting a PC. You don't need it. Most people are now switching you know, to their iPhones anyway. And as I said, there can be various combinations. And so some people use both. Some people use primarily one. Um, you can go into the whole affordance literature and argue why there might be differences by device. And here's just a few things. I mean, the mobile phone for people of a certain age, um, that is younger than I am, um, that is the threshold is much younger than I am because I'm old. Um, it's difficult to read. <laughs> you know, it's just a small, tiny screen, no matter how good the resolution is. It's very difficult. It's, the menus are sometimes non-intuitive, difficult. And remember, if you have the language issue, you've got that whole other layer of problems. So there's all sorts of issues that could affect whether a mobile phone would be better or worse for internet use. And same thing with the PC. Right? Printing, bigger screens, bigger keyboards. I, for instance, I really can't do much serious work on my laptop because I'm used to the desktop. It's a bigger keyboard. I got more functions, more of my own research. So I don't really do a lot of content work on my laptop when I travel. Um, so we know that there's an influence of demographics like a digital divide on the use of different devices. Um, we also think that there might be an effect of using the, the different devices on activities because of these affordances. Right? So does it, one question is, do demographics or devices matter more in terms of the activities we use? Um, there could be frequency and duration variations. Some people use things frequently, but when they get on, they don't use it for very long. Other people get on and they're, they're using it for a long period of time. Those are different kinds of use. They're highly related, but they're substantially different kinds. There's a whole literature on activity typologies. A simple one is between information and entertainment. And you can group, just like with the uses and gratifications literature, there's three or four dimensions. And then there's also the issue of breadth. That is, if you use more online activities, it's not just you're using the system more. You're actually gaining access to a diversity and maybe even a integration among them. So activity breadth is a term that's been developed and also used. And the argument is you get more social capital benefits by having broader activity breadth. So here we're just looking at Armenia. And you can see that uh, uh, 420 actually use the internet. And here's the breakdown. Um, almost 3 quarters use PC-based primarily. It doesn't mean they don't use mobile at all. But we ask them what's your primary. And about 13%, well, I, I use both equally. So that's the categories we use. And it's interesting that there's lots of different ways. You might think mobile phone versus laptop. But there's lots of combinations. You can actually tether your mobile phone to your laptop and have your mobile phone using your laptop connection or use your laptop <laughs> as your interface for your mobile phone connection. Big thing in um, these countries are these USB wireless. You pop them in, you pay for them, and you have a certain number of hours that are available to you. Um, 
So you can have access both to your laptop and to your mobile phone and then many combinations in between. Here is just a breakdown across the three countries, a color scheme. You can see in Armenia that is mostly PC, um, but then a mix of mobile only. And then it varies a lot by region. So for instance, here's the capital city. There's more access overall, more PC access. Here's the most rural areas, smaller access, but kind of you can see a balance between mobile and PC. There's less access to the hard technology. And so a higher proportion percentage of mobile phone access. And the same thing in the other countries. Most of it is none. No access. That's right. right. I was going to make a joke about the Catholic Church, but I won't. <laughs> Most of it is they go ask their nuns. Um, OK, so we did bi binary logistic regressions on adoption, adopt or not. And from the prior literature, all these main factors were still significant. Here, um, in terms of uh, adoption, uh, Males are more likely to adopt. Education is high and English is high, high. And we explain almost half the variance. In device, here you have the three categories. You can use multinomial regression and use both as, as kind of the reference categories. So you're predicting the other two categories. And there aren't a lot of differences, actually. There's not a, there's, we explain about a third of the variance, but it's based almost entirely on if you have um, a lower economic condition, you're more likely to use a mobile phone. So that fits the leapfrogging argument. And we found that early in our comparison to internet and, and uh, mobile phone, too. So the mobile phone is actually a mechanism for reducing the typical economic digital divide. And people who are older use the PC. And some of that's related to work, and some of it's related to sophistication. But so only two variables, but it explains an awful lot you know, for these kinds of studies. So here's kind of the breakdown across the three. And you can see the significant differences. So for instance, um, downloading music is about equal. Uh, social network systems, people use their mobile phones for that. It's kind of part of the lifestyle. And um, not a lot of other really major differences. With online news, people don't look at news by mobile phone. It's a print, text, you know, more work-related kind of activity. And so here's kind of a, a chart of those. And so you can see that some activity is very high and some are low. And in some cases, there are significant differences across the devices. So device matters in terms of activities. And then the question is, well, do those activities matter? Is it if you spend more time looking at videos and playing games and listening to music and doing social network because they're more accessible by a mobile phone, they're doing more activities, but actually smaller breadth and maybe less social capital because they're doing more sort of social entertainment. But there's a whole debate and discussion, and I've actually done a big review, that social connection is itself, of course, a precursor to social capital. So it's not, it's not you know, very clear. So in terms of usage, once you've actually got on here, um, in terms of frequency, if you're younger, use it more. If you're richer, um, eat less. Yeah, if you're younger, use it more. If you're richer, use it more. Device doesn't matter in terms of the actual frequency. So that's interesting in terms of getting on to the internet and how many times you use it. Device doesn't matter. So that's, that's nice to know. In terms of duration, um, it does matter. Uh, language, because now you have to process more text. So it doesn't show up in terms of frequency. And mobile, um, it, you spend less time each time or overall. Could be due to cost, but also because of the small you know, poor affordances. It's really difficult to do a lot of work on a mobile phone. But it doesn't explain a lot of variance. And then how about activities? Well, the demographics do matter. Every demographic influenced at least two activities. The device mattered depending upon the activity. So PC users, primarily users, engaged in more work activities. Makes sense. Also might be required. They actually engage in more video watching, and that might be an affordance issue. It's just a bigger screen, um, but less social networking. Whereas mobile-based people did a, a less instant messaging. It might seem counterintuitive, but there are many alternatives. And they, they, watch, they read less news. In terms of frequency, um, all the variables except these three influence frequency. And we explain, depending on the activity, up to a quarter of the variance. So there's some differences by device. <laughs> Not massive, but there is some. And then the question is whether those would differentially affect social capital. Uh, work, 
Uh, social networking depends. Video watching depends on what you watch, I guess. And online news, that's the only one that's pretty clear in the literature. Less news makes for less civic awareness, less participation, less political social capital. Um, I won't go over these, but let's just pick one. Let's pick uh, search engines. These are, looking at media interactions, let's just look at search engines. These are the factors that significantly predict more use of search engines. So English language, well, searching on terms, you have to know the language in order to search for terms. So if you don't have English language, you're going to be um, uh, um, existing in a digital divide in terms of search engines. You're not going to be able to find stuff because you don't know the terms to search for. PC is much better for using search engines. Uh, if more in the urban, if you have um, um, Mobile owner users engaging a search engine are those with higher education. So if you have higher education, it overcomes the limitation of mobile phone. You, you know more, probably also know more English as well. So you can go through each of the activities the same kind of way and develop. And what Katie's actually done, she's actually followed up with interviews, and she's done a, a qualitative profile analysis. She's found two or three individual cases with their profiles, their personal background, and asked ask them about each of these activities linked to their data on these variables. Very interesting stuff. So we did that for all the activities. And finally, breadth is the total number of activities. There's a little interesting literature on activity and breadth. More English, less mobile, more use in general, explains about 15%. So breadth is affected, and it's also affected both by demographics, not only English, but also by device. So if you use mobile phone, you're going to be engaged in fewer overall activities. So it maybe overcome the limitation and leapfrog the technology, but it also might minimize a little bit the total number of activities you engage in. So it's kind of a trade-off, right? Access versus breadth and possible social capital. Just to show you, yes, we did it. OK. So we've talked about all these things. How are we doing on time? We have one more study. There are a bunch of limitations, some of which I'm sure you've already realized, and others that we've discovered. But, you know, we did the best we can. One of the questions was these activities. It's not the full range of activities you'll find in these typologies. These activities were developed by people in the field there, partially with the things they're interested in. But they weren't really looking so much at the civic engagement stuff. So it's limited in that sense. My guess is that if you built more of the civic engagement activities in, you'd find a bigger difference between mobile phone. Except we know that mobile phone, Twitter, has been widely used for political activism. So it's, you know, it's a small explanation. OK, so our last study is, um, so I was trained in and teach a course in and publish in, in Diffusion of Innovations. And I thought, well, they're often invoked together in the literature, but they actually have some slightly different arguments. So the Diffusion literature, well, let's go back here. In the Divide literature, it, the argument is, is there's these gaps. Over time, they might narrow, some of which because of policy things, some of which just because of time, and some things might not change at all. But it doesn't really say anything about time. That is, it doesn't say there's a, that these differences would be larger or smaller any particular time period. The argument is that they should decrease over time. They should, prescriptively, and they should predictably. And some of them do. Whereas the diffusion literature actually makes a slightly more distinction, a, a finer distinction. It says that there are these adoption categories, and there's a whole literature on this. And it says as um, we look at adoption over time, we can break down the categories of adopters into kind of a normal distribution. Of course, that curve varies by innovation and culture. But this is the time at which somebody adopt from zero when no money adopted to saturation. And it's just the artifact, uh, the arbitrary distinction of standard deviation. So the first standard deviation, or the third to the left, is the, we call these innovators, really early adopters. They're very different from everybody else. They're not, not like you or me, except um, maybe a few in this room who are very early adopters. I'm not an innovator. You know, I'm not going to be the first person to adopt stuff. You have to have extra technical knowledge. You have to have extra resources. Typically, these people um, aren't deeply connected in a broader social network, but they might be highly connected in their own geek network. 
They're not influential to the other people because they're very different. They're willing to put up with complexities. They're willing to put up errors and bugs. They like the notion of adopting earlier. Whereas these people here, these are kind of the mass uh, audience that most producers want to get. They want to know that something's going to work, it's going to be reliable, it's brand, I can get service, I don't have to think about it, and it's going to bring me benefits, either entertainment, pleasure, social, or economic. So these people are quite different from these people. And then the laggards may or may not adopt. Um, they're very resistant to change in general, and they don't have a lot of resources. OK, here's a sleight of hand. I'm going to apply this at the national level. Now, you could actually have, and, and there's been one or two studies where we've actually collected data from 160 countries on the ex where they are on the adoption curve. So you have a, an N of 160, and each country can be placed into one of these categories. We don't have that. What we have is surveys over time, over eight years. And it just so happened, as you'll see, that it maps very nicely onto this. But it's only within one country, so we have to control for within country var uh, things. And also, it is true that because you have survey data, if somebody says they've adopted in this survey, they might actually have adopted here, and they're still continuing. Because this data didn't ask when you adopted, only have you adopted. So this is a very conservative test. That is, it's minimizing actual differences across these categories. So if we find any differences at all, it's a suggestion that this might matter. But what we'd really like to ask, and I do in my own studies, but I don't have these national data, is when did you adopt? And of course. I do that in my own classes, and people say things like, I mean, there's always a small number. When did you adopt mobile phone for internet use? 15 years ago. A, they weren't alive, probably, and also there was no mobile internet. So people you know, are not so accurate in that kind of data collection. So we have characteristics of these categories of adopters, and we can try and link them to the digital divide variables of sociodemographics and, and social factors. And so we can say, it's possible that we could make predictions that would be a little more specific than the general digital divide ones, which is that these things matter. We can say, well, some of these things matter more in certain stages than others. right? And so it, think of this as kind of an addition to the digital divide. So in Armenia, um, there's also macro factors. It turns out there was a different um, market entries. There were some changes in telecommunications policy. The monopoly was relinquished. New providers came in, new services, better coverage. And so that's certainly going to uh, matter. So an implication for rural areas is if there's stronger signal and broader coverage, more people in the rural areas are going to adopt. And so urbanness might not matter anymore. And so that's only going to happen later on and after this market entry. So region or urbanness might matter early on in the early majority but it might not matter in the late majority. There's also more users, and so there's greater critical mass, and so there's more benefit to, to adopting, and it's easier to adopt. We also have uh, the GDP per capita normalized in 2,000 US dollars. So the general economic condition of the country should matter, and it does because in 2008, they suffered like everybody else from the global financial collapse. So the GDP actually dropped a lot during those couple of years. And it hasn't really come back to the level before then. So here's a plot of, um, this is our data, our survey data. And so we have from 2004 to 2011. And it just so turns out in 2004, there was 22%, um, which is in the early majority category. We don't have survey data from before then. There was not one in 2003. And the earlier one didn't really ask these questions. We have ITU data, just as a kind of a confirmation. The curves generally about the same. There's a peak there that I don't understand. But generally, the argument is, is there was low adoption here. So we can't really study the innovators and early adopters who may be different from these other people. So that's another weakness. Can't do anything about that. Oh, and then these are the market entry um, points. Different vendors and different policies changed. And then we have also GDP mapped onto this. So we'd like to bring all those things into one model. Doing that took me most of the fall, because I had to learn new methods that I didn't know. But we have great faculty, like Renee, who would constantly revise me. So the digital divide model would say, well, the simplest one is we just combine all the years, and we just say there's these direct digital you know, sociodemographic effects. If that's the case, the model fits pretty well. 
there's an effect of market entry for two of the years, not all of the years. GDP is a positive influence. And then most of the socio-demographics, as we would expect, matter in the ways that we would expect. So if we just combine it all with a standard digital divide model, and it makes sense. In most cases, that would be it. But if we add these three adopter categories, that is combine, take the whole data, but then use dummy codes for the adopter categories, and then also control for the second level effect of within year shared variance. You have to do things like center things. So the demographics are centered around the means of those variables within each year, and GDP is centered around the overall grand mean across the years. This model fits better than this model. See this number here, 9970? This number here, 10480? Smaller is better. And further, you take that difference and divide it by the number, the change in degrees of freedom. There's 17, there's 41. So the number declined, even though there's still a good number of degrees of freedom, but that difference is significant. It's a better model, but a not a massively better model. It explains about 5% more variance. All right, so again, uh, this is a conservative test. So there's some hint that uh, adding on a division, uh, diffusion model might make things a little better. So here, some of the variables are the same, but they change by the adopter category, early majority, late majority, laggard. So there's difference in effects by adopter categories for many, although not all, of the demographics. So the diffusion model actually helps explain more what's going on in ways that actually make sense. So these are the means you can show in some cases, like age. Um, so an interaction effect would be when one, when one of the curves changed differently than the other curves. And so there's some small effect. It's not huge. That one, particularly uh, economic condition, um, color TV, and internet use. So there's some strong interac interaction effects. Here's a macro influence. The um, market entries show that in 2005, shortly after adoption, almost doubled. In 2009, it was near saturation. And um, we can explain what happened with these market entries. And then here's GDP. And so you can see GDP over time went up way up to here, and then way back here, and then I'm starting to get back. So the overall relation is about 0.82, but it's not linear. Lots of speculations, but we're running out of time. I'll just pick one. Um, I explained that there's more adoption in less urban areas after their own majority because there's more powerful and accessible services. So the market entry actually changes the technology context. And so the urbanness divide disappears after the first year because of increasing adoption and changing services. All right, three last slides. So divides the demographics in language the variables we would expect. They vary by stage of adoption. Language matters in these cases because the language is so different. In the demographics devices, device matters. It's influenced differentially. It doesn't have a huge effect on all the variables. Um, it does have effects on the kind of activities, and particularly activity breadth. And then this last one, we see both approaches work pretty well. The adding on the diffusion adopter categories um, brings a little more insight, doesn't explain a ton more variance, but it gives you a little more purchase on explanations. And particularly when you add in these more macro factors, you can begin to explain things, what's happening and why they're happening over time. All right. Whew. A lot of stuff.